Hey everyone. My name's Alex. I'm a engineer on Instacart's catalog team. A little more than a year ago, Instacart's catalog was struggling to keep up with its growth. Oh, should I move forward some slides? We were struggling to keep up with our growth. Every release we were making was patching one of the dozens of critical bottlenecks in our data pipeline that had been assembled in haste, and it seemed like we couldn't release fast enough. Every week, there are multiple alarms going off that were indicating that uh, we were either hitting up against thresholds uh, for that data had entered our system that was bad and that we needed to address it for some reason or another. So I don't think anyone would be surprised by this. Instacart was growing very rapidly after all. And like many startups, our staffing was struggling to keep up with that growth. But I'm here today to talk about how we recovered from that situation. So today, Instacart's catalog covers a substantial fraction of North America's grocery stores, and we're now poised so that we can grow significantly beyond that. We're also now confident that we can deal with any sort of bad data that enters into our system. So we got to this position by adopting the same sort of principles that you find in functional programming. Maxime Beauchemin of Lyft likes to call this functional data pipeline, or sorry, functional data engineering, which I think is a great term. Uh, we're basically talking about taking the same concepts that we have in functional programming that give us confidence in the correctness of our systems, and we're applying them to large volumes of data. Well, I like to call the resulting systems functional data pipelines. So in this talk, I'll first be going over the uh, history of Instacart's catalog to give you an idea of the context. And then I'll be diving into uh, what I mean by functional data pipelines, what they are, uh, why you want one, and how you'll know when you have one. Uh, and then the meat of this talk will be going through the tools and techniques that our catalog has used to make our data pipelines functional. Uh, the idea being that uh, you'll be able to hopefully apply some of these techniques to, uh, to your systems since we all have bad data that we need to deal with. And a lot of these concepts are equally applicable uh, no matter what size system you have. So for as common as they are, groceries are actually quite difficult to deal with. Uh, groceries update very frequently. Their stock turns over very rapidly compared to most goods. And they also go on sale very frequently. So that means that uh, if you're tracking groceries, your system has a lot of updates associated with it. And additionally, uh, Instacart in particular uses a lot of different sources of data that we combine together to give you that storefront experience that we have. Uh, so this is data from our own shoppers. It's data from the retailers that are stocking these goods. Uh, it's data from the consumer packaged good companies that are manufacturing these goods. Uh, and we use some other sources of data as well. But tying all of these sources to dig of data together is difficult because groceries are hard to ID. Uh, if you're very lucky, a grocery will have a UPC, so a universal product code that consistently refers to the same product, uh, but you don't always get that. Sometimes manufacturers or retailers will reuse the same barcode, effectively changing the meaning of that product. Uh, and other types of groceries like fruit and vegetables and uh, bulk goods will use PLUs, which vary in meaning from place to place. Uh, additionally, Instacart in particular uh, is partnered with hundreds of different retailers. Uh, so we uh, because of that, have had to integrate our systems with dozens of different inventory systems, each of which have their own unique quirks. So we've had to deal with all of these challenges of groceries at a scale that most companies don't have an opportunity to operate at. Uh, currently, we're handling about 5 billion points of data uh, a day entering our system, which, for some context, is, as far as I can tell, about 10 times more tweets than Twitter handles every day. Despite its current size, Instacart's catalog uh, has a fairly humble beginning. Like basically all of Instacart, our catalog started as a Rails app. Our catalog was just a few models within that Rails app. Uh, and one of the first big catalog initiatives we had was to buy every item within a Trader Joe's so that we could photograph it, so that we could enter that data into our system. 
uh, which was clearly not very scalable of a way of growing, but to hit our first million items in our catalog, uh, which is about what you find in 30 grocery stores, to get to that point and for the next few million items, uh, we relied basically entirely on ma manual data entry. Our catalog entered a new era of growth when we developed a data entry pipeline to allow retailers to send us their data directly. Uh, but this pipeline was actually pretty quickly overwhelmed by the volume of data that was coming into our system, uh, since we were very quickly adding new partners to our platform at the time. Uh, with some difficulty, however, we did scale that system by uh, over, or by around 100 times to the volume that it was originally able to handle. Uh, but the result was still a system that kept us up at night. Not only was scaling very difficult, uh, but fixing data that had entered our system that was bad had become the full-time job of several engineers. Uh, so earlier this year, we decided to take a step back and ask ourselves what a catalog that could handle another 100 times scale would look like. And much more than being able to handle scale, we were asking ourselves what a, uh, what a system that would give us confidence in our correctness would look like. We wanted something where we could be sure that our data was good, that we would have the tools to handle any data that was bad, and uh, as well as the tools to improve our existing data. Uh, and in addition to that, we wanted a system that was more flexible than what we had ended up with. After years of incremental improvements to our catalog, uh, we, we had ended up with a system that was fairly brittle. Uh, so we wanted something that could allow us to move more freely and iterate faster to better serve our business. So from these design goals, we created a design that is based on these functional principles that uh, I've mentioned. Uh, but in order to reach this design, we knew that we needed a infrastructure that would be able to, one, handle a large volume of data, to store a large volume of data, as well as be able to uh, operate or compute over a large volume of that data. Uh, since, as we had found in our system, there's quite a big difference between uh, just storing data and having a system that is prepared to operate it and query over that and have that readily available. Uh, if that system hasn't been built specifically with that ability in mind, then that data tends to be kind of lost and it takes a lot of engineering effort to pull that out. So our first design was based around Spark, which is kind of the normal thing that you might reach for when you have these criteria, Spark being a general purpose platform for scalable computing uh, over distributed data sets. But we realized when we were evaluating our other options that uh, Snowflake actually checked a lot of the boxes that uh, we were looking for. So similar to Spark, Snowflake uh, separates its uh, storage from its compute, allows you to store a large volume of data on a cheap storage medium. Uh, and the compute is separate, so you can scale that up and down and out, basically however you want, which made us confident that we weren't gonna run into any bottlenecks with that system. Uh, further, Snowflake, everything is managed through a uniform SQL interface. Uh, which turned out to be really the right level of abstraction for uh, our, our application. We found that in recreating our catalog almost purely in SQL, we were able to reduce our code base by over 60%. Snowflake is also fully managed, so it's quite easy to get up and running, uh, as well as to uh, start experimenting with it. Uh, it's got some other nice features, like uh, transactions and variant data types that you don't necessarily find with other databases of a similar type. Uh, and all told, it was just a lower level of effort than uh, the, the other alternatives that we were evaluating. Uh, Snowflake, though, of course, doesn't solve everything for us. We still need a good design uh, and schema in order to build a useful system. Uh, but it let us focus on our domain-specific problems uh, precisely. Uh, so let's uh, get talking about the, the philosophy behind that design that, uh, that I've been talking about. So our, our design is based around these functional programming principles, as I've said, uh, but applied to data pipelines. The idea being that we want to have a full understanding of how we got to any piece of data, such that any piece of data in your system is fully reproducible. 
when you have systems that are built to be both transparent and deterministic, then the result is uh, a system that is easy to understand as well as more adaptable to, uh, to the future. Not only do such systems let you recover from any bad states that you can get into, but they also allow you to move in to any potential future states that your input data might allow for. So in practice, uh, functional data pipelines manifest as a series of append-only inputs. They're append-only so that uh, for a given point of time, you can consider your input uh, immutable. And these inputs are passed through a set of discrete transformations uh, in order to arrive at an output. Each of these transformations should be uh, basically a pure functional unit, so isolated and free from the sort of side effects that could make them hard to reason about and impossible to reproduce. So to gain a bit more understanding about what I mean by functional systems, we can look at the kind of most simple functional uh, system possible, which is just an input passed through a function of that input that arrives at an output. In functional programming, we build our systems out of units like this uh, to avoid changing state and mutating data. Basically, the idea is that uh, if a function is pure, then any time we pass the same input to our function, uh, we will arrive at that same output. And building functions in this, fashion, in this fashion make them easy to reason about, and in turn, composing our systems out of these functional building blocks make the systems easier to reason about. So for data pipelines, uh, we, we get an idea from this, the sort of building blocks that we're talking about. Uh, we have raw immutable data that is passed into our system that are passed through these transformations in order to arrive at derived outputs. And we treat all of these things as first class concepts. But of course in data pipelines, our data is also changing uh, over time. Uh, so if we uh, want to apply a example to this set of inputs, uh, for Instacart, we could be tracking the price of a pound of bananas as it comes into our catalog over time, and we're passing this price through some transformation. This transformation could also be changing over time in order to arrive at an output. Uh, looking at this sort of uh, history of uh, functional values, we can see that the, the minimum that we need to record in order to arrive at a full history of the system we would need to record a full history of our inputs, as well as a record of which transformations were applied to each input. Uh, and when you have recorded both of these things, then all of your Ys are fully derivable. So why would we want fully derivable Ys? Well, when we have that, then it means we can always recover from any bad states that our system could arrive at. Uh, and this might sound very basic in principle, and it is, but uh, it, differs from how a lot of systems are constructed. So we're gonna take a look at how, uh, what happens when uh, you omit one or both of these pieces of historical tracking. So the very worst case that we get uh, is a system uh, that only has a recent output. And so this is the sort of thing that you'll find in CRUD applications frequently. Uh, where you have a server running and it will take an input from somewhere and it will modify that input based on the currently running version of code. Uh, and then it will save that, that modified data in a database, probably overriding the previous value that was there. So this is pretty bad, uh, since if you have a bad input come into your system or if you have a bad transformation at any point, uh, then there's not much you can do about it. You basically have to wait for a new input to come in and you to hope that your transformation is good at that point of time, uh, and that's about all you can do. So in order to uh, try to improve the situation, sometimes we'll add audits to our systems, which look like a tracking the history of outputs from our system, uh, which is better than nothing. You can at least roll back to a previous output state of the system, but it's still not great, particularly if you have a bad transformation in your system then uh, if, if you are trying to recover, you need to roll back, but that means you're throwing out a good input for no particular, for, for a bad reason, really. Uh, so in order to combat that, we can either save our last input or we could save a full history of inputs as well as the history of our outputs, which looks quite a bit better. Uh, at least now we are confident that we can move through our history of inputs and outputs. Uh, and this was actually the state of catalog for quite some time, uh, but it's still not great. 
So for an example, going back to our tracking the price of bananas in our system, uh, what happens if we need to figure out what happened when we have a bad transformation? Uh, say this transformation has been uh, bad for a week. We've been uh, arriving at the wrong price for our bananas. Uh, and we want to go back and refund anybody who overpaid for their bananas. Uh, so the way that we do that in a system that's organized like this is to uh, take our inputs, pass them through an amended transformation in order to arrive at a new set of outputs and compare that new set of outputs to our actual set of outputs and see where they converge or diverge to see where our problem started. Uh, which is not maybe the worst for the simple example, but uh, it systems get a lot more complicated than this, and as they get more complicated, data becomes more interdependent. Uh, you end up having multiple inputs to transformations, and figuring these things out can be very difficult. Uh, and generally, when systems are constructed that look like this, they tend not to uh, have automated ways for moving between inputs to outputs, since there is this missing uh, history of what was applied. Uh, so it tends to be a fairly manual effort. Uh, so basically, we want to get to a state where we're not cheating ourselves out of the data that we need in order to reproduce our system. So when you end up with a system that's transparent and deterministic, uh, coupled with enough data in order to reproduce any point in history at a time, uh, then you have a functional data pipeline. This may sound like a lot of criteria to ask for, but if you don't have this, then you end up with a system where you uh, are at the mercy of bad states that you can get into. So let's talk about how we did that. We are now getting into the meat of this presentation. Uh, this is definitely the bulk of it. Uh, we'll be talking about tools that our catalog has adopted to make ourselves functional. Uh, and there's really not one thing that you need to adopt. These are just kind of some generally applicable principles. Uh, and also, you don't need to adopt all of them necessarily. The goal really is to build deterministic systems that, that avoid side effects that make reasoning difficult. However you get to that goal uh, is great. So I'll be talking about how we track our history of data. I'll be talking about how we recover from bad data states. And I'll be talking about a concept that we call data build systems. Uh, and throughout this, uh, I'll be talking in, in the, I'll be giving examples that are placed in the context of Snowflake. Uh, but really, these, these concepts are generally applicable to different databases. So on its surface, tracking the history of data seems like quite a simple thing. When data comes in, you record that data that has come in, and then you never change it. You don't touch it, because if you touch it, then it means that you are violating that principle of reproducibility. Uh, this, this is a pretty commonly known pattern. It's commonly known as event sourcing. Uh, and you end up with tables that kind of look like this, where you have data coming in, data has a value uh, that is created at some point in time. And here I'm, I'm referring to a primary key as kind of the entity key that is uniquely referring to an entity rather than uh, the unique key for a row in your data. But when you're working with data in this format, uh, the question is always what is the most recent uh, value for each primary key at a given point in time? Uh, and so uh, here I've highlighted the most recent value for each primary key, and the challenge is how do you get to that? If we're looking at uh, answering that question in SQL, we can find that with a window function that looks like this, where we're partitioning our data by our primary key, and within each of those partitions, we're sort sorting by created at, and then we're taking the top uh, value for each uh, of our primary keys. Operating over your data in this format uh, works fine if you just have fairly small tables. Uh, running this window function over it will be okay. But as your data grows, you run into a pretty steep performance penalty, since this is effectively looking at the full history of your data every time. So in order to uh, get over those performance penalties, we can start uh, adopting snapshots of our system. Snapshots basically being a computational checkpoint of that work that we have done to find the most recent values uh, for our primary keys at a given point in time. Uh, so here you can see we, we have these most recent values and we have saved those values in this snapshot table. And if you have still relatively small tables, say 100 million records or so, 
uh, Snowflake is able to pretty quickly create these snapshots a, a matter of seconds. Uh, and so you could access these snapshot tables and not run into performance penalties that would be associated from that window. But if your data grows even larger than that, then even taking these snapshots can start taking a significant amount of time since it's looking over the entire history of your data. So in order to overcome that, we can start using uh, incremental snapshots where we're basing each new snapshot off of the previous snapshot plus any data that has arrived since then. We, that the previous illustration kind of looks like this if we're looking at it in SQL and in table form where we uh, have the same window function, but uh, we, we've changed the data source that we're using. We're now using the most recent snapshot uh, plus any data that has occurred since then. And with this way, we, uh, we, we can use this function as actually the basis of our next snapshot, but it can also be used to access the kind of up to the second uh, values for your data. Uh, but a word of caution, this can still actually be kind of slow, particularly if you have a lot of primary keys, your snapshots can be quite large. So there are some ways that we can overcome that slowness. Uh, first, what we do is we order our data as it is uh, being written into our snapshots, uh, such that we're clustering it around some value that we'll be pulling that data out by. In the catalog, we tend to cluster by store, since our values are frequently accessed by store, we do computations by store, and our data tends to come in clustered naturally around those store values. Then when we are selecting our data, uh, we can filter out by that store key, uh, which makes it so that we only need to pull out the partitions that we're actually interested in. Uh, so in this very simple example, we have a snapshot table and new data coming in, and we have these clusters that we're only interested in the values for cluster four. And you can see for this simple example, we've reduced the amount of data that we need to look at from 12 different partitions down to two. But in practice, we've actually found that uh, our, our, the amount of data that we need to fetch in our queries uh, has been reduced and sped up by a factor of 100, which is pretty good. This has let us get the most recent values for, uh, for a, uh, an entity in a given store at a given point of time. Uh, in a matter of seconds, which uh, is the, the sort of performance that we need for this operation that uh, isn't done all the time, but it's very nice to be able to see what was the value of this thing at this point in time and have that pop up quite quickly. So uh, storing our data and accessing it in this format was an area where we really uh, found that Snowflake helped us a good deal. Uh, we, were, we were able to store our snapshot history and our event table history uh, basically an unlimited amount of this data. Uh, and then we're able to pull that data out regardless of how old it is, basically all at the same speed, uh, which gives us the ability to kind of travel back and forth in time with our data, uh, looking at from one snapshot to another uh, with consistent performance. So there's a couple of other techniques you could use to uh, arrange your data to always get the most cons con uh, the, the most recent values for a given pr primary key. Uh, we could store two different tables. We could create a historical table and a current table and always insert into our historical table and upsert in the other table. Uh, Snowflake works much better with immutable data, so those upsets aren't that great. Uh, and while you could have these tables in two different data stores, for our application, it just wasn't worth the headache of coordinating two different data stores. Uh, you could also uh, use materialized views to uh, materialize those, those latest values for each of your primary keys. Uh, but in Snowflake, materialized views have not yet reached general availability, so we haven't had that much experience in them, though we are hoping to use them to speed up a few parts of our system. So you may be asking what is so functional about storing history. And in reality, there's nothing particularly functional about it. It's just a prerequisite to getting yourself into a state uh, where, where you can consider your inputs immutable. And you may have also noticed that snapshots are actually a fairly stateful concept. They are just a byproduct of a computation that we have performed. But much like in functional programming, if we 
only have our stateful concepts kind of isolated and uh, partitioned from, from the way we're doing computations, uh, then we're, we're able to isolate the complexity that would otherwise be associated with stateful data. So on top of the uh, kind of main application data that comes in, there's a couple of other pieces of data that are often overlooked when we're talking about storing the history of data, particularly configuration and transformations. Uh, configuration are sometimes stored as data. Uh, there are I think often stored as data, but sometimes also just implied in an implementation. Uh, and either way, they're often not tracked as rigorously as we might want. And really tracking our configuration is super important since uh, configuration is, in effect, the, the way that we interpret our input data. And if you don't have the configuration that was uh, present when your data came in, then that data loses its intent. You can see looking at a function that takes configuration in, uh, that configuration is an input to that function. So you, if we're not tracking that configuration, then we certainly don't have uh, repeatability in our system. Thankfully, tracking configurations is pretty simple. Uh, the, the volume of data associated with configurations tends to be pretty low. So we can tend to just add them into our, our event table, put a window over that view, uh, put a view over that window, over that table, and call that a day. Transformations, on the other hand, are a bit trickier to track uh, because transformations are, after all, not data in themselves. They're a description of a computation, uh, and they also don't happen in isolation. Transformations only really exist after they've been applied to data. Uh, so because of the the trickiness associated with them, I think it's actually important to figure out which transformations are worth to track first, and I'll argue that some of them aren't. Some transformations are purely structural in nature. Uh, so for example, if we, if we join two tables together and we output that data into a new table, then I would argue that that is a purely structural transformation. We haven't really changed the meaning of that input data. Uh, conversely, if, say, we have applied a non-linear markup to our uh, pound of bananas that is coming in, and we're applying that markup based on the country of origin, then the value that we're outputting has actually differed fairly fundamentally in meaning from the value that we have input. And it's these sort of trans transformations that I think are super valuable to track. Uh, and the question is, how do you track that? Well, basically, like how you track any other sort of code, uh, we can hash that code value. Uh, we could either take the, the git sha of the, the commit of code that we're running, or we could hash the, ver the SQL that is representative of a transformation. Uh, and then we store that value along with either the derived data that we're creating, if we know that we're going to be keeping that derived data around, uh, or we can track those transformations separately along with what input values they were applied to in a separate table. Uh, so at this point, I've talked a fair bit about how we store our data such that it can be uh, fully reproducible uh, over any point of time. And one of the most interesting ways that we can apply that data is to uh, help recover from bad data that has come into our system. There are two paths that you can take when recovering from bad data, and you generally don't have a choice of which you get to take. Uh, you can either remove data or you can fix it. And if data has come into your system and that data is bad, you generally have no way of inferring what that data should have been. So we need to remove the resulting data from our systems. Conversely, if we have transformed data and our transformation is bad, uh, then we usually want to fix our transformation, reapply it to whatever inputs there were in that transformation so that we can arrive at the right value for those inputs. So I'll start by talking about amending, since it tends to be a bit easier to deal with, particularly when we're tracking the history of our data in this format. So here I have an example where we are tracking uh, the history of a transformation that's being applied to some upstream value. We are uh, recording a new value that is the result of this transformation. And we're recording that this upstream data was created at a given point in time, and the transformation was applied at this generated at timestamp. And because we have a large amount of these transformed data that we're creating, uh, we're going to create a snapshot of that data as well. 
Uh, so in this example, say we have decided that the transformation that starts with the hash 2e8 is bad. Uh, then we want to fix that data that has been transformed. So how would we do that? Well, first we need a good transformation, and we'll say in this example that this bb2 that occurs afterwards is good. We will take that transformation, apply it to that input data that has been passed through the faulty transformation, and append the new results onto our table. So doing so looks like this, where we've added new data onto our transform data history, uh, and that's just the same snapshot from before. And looking at these results, we can see that uh, if you modify your window slightly to take into account that generated that, then the right values for that, uh, that piece of data kind of pop out based on that window. So in this example, that uh, data associated with primary key three uh, is, uh, has, is the same value or same input data as the primary key three in the snapshot, but since it has a newer generated at, we're preferentially selecting that data, and that's the one that is the result of that window. Conversely, the data associated with primary key four, uh, some new data has occurred since our original data came in, uh, and that data that has that higher created at in our snapshot is the one that we were taking. Uh, so in this way, we uh, have a kind of uniform way to recover from this, uh, any bad transformations. And sometimes we'll want to do the same sort of things for configuration. Sometimes uh, we've applied configuration in error, or maybe we've re renegotiated a contract and we want to reapply that configuration uh, to see what our data could have been. Uh, so we can do basically the same thing. This is a very similar example, so I'll speed through it. We have a transform history where uh, we're recording what uh, inputs and configuration we have applied to a transform separately from the actual data that we have transformed. And say we want to reinterpret the data associated with configuration 302, uh, well, we do it in the same way. We append new data that is describing that we've applied this transformation and the data that we have applied this transformation to. Uh, and the right values will come about from our window function. Uh, so in this fashion, we, we're treating the recovery from our data in kind of the same way, regardless of whether or not it was uh, source data or configuration or transformations that were bad. Uh, but when we get to removing data, it's a bit trickier. Uh, so we'll simplify things to start where we have a event data table that has no snapshots at all. Uh, since those snapshots are really what make recovering or removing data difficult. So uh, we, we've decided in this example that the input uh, that's associated with the source ID 102 is bad. Uh, something was wrong with that input. We need to remove that data from our system. And we don't want to just delete that data from our table because that would violate that principle of reproducibility. So instead, we append new data. Uh, preferentially to a new table, tends to be a bit easier to track, uh, where we're describing that we have deleted this data at this point of time. And we can even add a bit of context as to why we deleted that, which can help quite a bit in, uh, in retroactively going back and seeing why we've done things. So in order to apply those deletions, uh, we simply need to join that deleted at table to any points of data where we're uh, using that original data source. So here we have that same window as before, uh, and we're just joining that table and excluding any data that's associated with that deleted data. Uh, and we can use the same sort of technique to discover and fix any sort of downstream data that, was, uh, that came from that deleted data source. Uh, so this example is pretty straightforward because there's no source involved, uh, but when we have, or, Sorry, no state involved. And when we have state, things are definitely trickier. So uh, when snapshots come in, we have more difficulty figuring out how to delete things. And I think the first thing that we need to ask ourselves is what do we want a snapshot to represent? Uh, since snapshots are just a byproduct of a computation, they're just an optimization uh, to help us or save us from doing too much work. And because they're just a byproduct, we can decide what we want them to mean. So we could either decide that we want snapshots to mean that they are the correct state for a given point of time, or we could decide that they're supposed to be the actual state for a given point of time. 
So here we have a diagram of uh, bad data that has entered the system that was represented by red, uh, and it has kind of infected these snapshots that have occurred since that bad data. Uh, so if, if we've decided that we want our snapshots to represent the correct state of the system, then when we remove our bad data, and again, we're not actually removing it, we're just saying we've removed it, uh, when we remove our data, then we should actually be replacing our snapshots with correct snapshots, or at least marking those snapshots as bad. Uh, but that can be pretty difficult to do if your snapshots are quite old, uh, since you'll have a lot of different snapshots to recompute. Uh, and snapshots are supposed to save you from doing computation. So instead, we could decide that uh, snapshots should represent the actual state of the system at a given point of time, rather than the correct one. And when, when we've decided that, then when we have bad data that comes into our system, we leave the snapshots there. That is a snapshot of that system at that point of time. And uh, we'll fix the newest snapshot since then, and we could add other snapshots that retroactively describe what that data should have been, but we were free to leave our old snapshots with bad data around. Uh, so the question is then, how do we fix our snapshots when we have bad data? Uh, no matter what you have decided, the technique is the same. We just go back to the snapshot that was prior to that bad data enter entering our system, and then we replay history uh, such that we do not anymore have that bad data. Uh, and you can also see from looking at it in this way, data, bad data as it comes into our system is clustered around some partitions, and you actually don't need to recompute every partition. Uh, you can just recompute the partitions that are related to that bad data. Uh, and this sort of recovering from bad data, no matter where it happened in the history of our system, was another one of these places where Snowflake came quite handy, since we were able to have these snapshots staying around, uh, representing these recent or old points in time. Uh, so we were able to recompute the, the state that we wanted our systems to be in, uh, historically, basically using the exact same code that we used to get the most up-to-date values as well. Uh, so now moving on to a concept that is uh, a bit less broadly applicable, uh, but still quite handy uh, to apply when you can use it. Uh, it's most applicable when you don't have huge data sets, say less than a billion data points, uh, but the way those data sets interact are quite complicated. Uh, so this is a concept that uh, we've termed data build systems, and it is basically the same concepts that we take from continuous integration and deployment. Uh, where we're able to just merge code into a system and have deploys show up. Uh, we're taking those concepts and applying them to data. Uh, this is what our catalog has done for our product data, product data being the data that generally applies uh, over uh, a large set of our data, so like uh, data that isn't location specific. So the name or the image associated with the product, those names and images are generally stay the same no matter where you are. Uh, so that data set is pretty limited, but we have a lot of different data sources, and the way they combine can be pretty tricky. Uh, so we have applied this uh, data build system pattern. Uh, what we do here is we monitor our system for changes. So we're looking for changes to input data, we're looking for changes to code or configurations, which of course are just another type of input data, and when we find a, uh, a change to our inputs, then we record a new build. Uh, we assign an ID to that build, as well as record what inputs we had to that build. And because we have these immutable append-only tables, all we need to do is record uh, when that build was created, and as long as our build doesn't look at any data that is newer than that build, uh, the, the inputs are fixed at that point of time. So then we kick off our build process, and kicking that off is uh, just an arbitrary set of transformations. It can be whatever we want. That results in an arbitrary amount of outputs. Uh, and after we've gone through that, we arrive at a build artifact. Uh, and then we're then able to validate that build artifact. It can be both for internal consistency. We could validate that artifact against previous builds to see how many things have changed and see if those changes make sense. Uh, and then we record whether or not we think that build is successful or not. Uh, so if, it's, if that build passes, then we publish the results of that to the rest of our system. And if it 
uh, fails, then we uh, don't publish it. We mark it as bad, and uh, we signal that somebody should be looking into this build to figure out what went wrong. This also gives us a way of recovering from builds that were accidentally marked as successful. We can uh, retroactively mark a build as bad, and that will effectively roll back our system to a previous state. So you, you may notice some similarities between data build systems and snapshots in that they're kind of snapshotting uh, the state at a point in time. Uh, and you could consider data build systems a sort of special comprehensive snapshot, uh, whereas snapshots are supposed to be just a single purpose optimization and therefore fairly transparent. Otherwise, they hinder your understanding of, this, of a system. Build systems uh, are free to hide as much, much complexity as they want uh, because we have a full history of our inputs. We have a full description of what was run. Uh, and in that fashion, we have basically a fully functional unit in our build system. It is a large functional unit, but it is functional nonetheless. Uh, so if you can use build systems uh, to, to operate over your data, uh, it's, it's quite nice. Uh, it gives you a lot of the same conveniences as continuous integration and deployment. Uh, and they, they just let you change, change any piece of your code or have any input change and have the right results come into existence uh, with some checks and balances around them. So I've now covered three different tools that Instacart uses to make our data pipeline functional. Uh, I've gone over how we track history, which is a prerequisite to having repeatability in our system. I have gone over how we handle bad data, which is how we can leverage that history to arrive at the right state in our system. And I've talked about this concept of data build systems, which are these large functional units that uh, automate much of the management of data pipelines. So these are just foundational concepts, and they're not comprehensive in any regard. Uh, in particular, you may have noticed that I haven't actually talked about how we uh, build those discrete transformations that I've been talking about. Uh, and part of that is because I don't think there's much I could add outside of the literature that's already around for functional programming. We're taking the same sort of concepts. Uh, so since with, with functional programs, if you, if you don't have the tools to validate that your, that your functions are pure, then basically all you can do is be diligent in making sure that our functions are completely deterministic. And we do that by, uh, by making sure that we're not using or writing data to or from a place uh, that isn't completely reproducible. Uh, the goal, of course, is just to choose the right set of tools so that we can build systems that uh, make our overall system easy to reason about and deterministic. We want to have a clear path to understand where any piece of data in our system came about, and we want to be able to recompute any piece of our derived data at a given point in time. If you don't have these properties in your system, then you, you have something that is vulnerable to exceptional circumstances. Uh, and this is something that our catalog experienced quite viscerally with our previous catalog that wasn't built with this principle of reproducibility in mind. So from starting from strong first principles, we were able to put ourselves in a position where we had confidence in our catalog, as well as confidence to recover from any sort of bad states that our system could enter. Our newly resilient catalog was built in less time than the previous ad hoc fragile one, which is, I think, both a testament to how good design principles yield compounding returns, as well as how operating at the right level of abstraction and not having to worry too much about the underlying infrastructure allows you to move swiftly. So to this last point, uh, while we could have built this system without Snowflake, I know pretty certainly that it would have taken longer and the resulting thing would have been more complex. Uh, Snowflake gave us the right set of tools for our application such that we were able to uh, focus on our domain needs in particular, uh, and they were able to provide these robust tools to let us scale out uh, and our, our data and processing needs. So to that, uh, thank you to Snowflake for helping us build a system that we're proud of, and thanks all for listening.